So welcome everyone um, to this new uh, book author series that is being hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center and U of um, um, Detroit Center. Uh, thank you everyone for participating. Um, because we're now going virtual uh, due to this current situation, we are lucky enough to be able to interview wonderful artists from different um, places that are not that are outside of Michigan. One of them, um, Paul Betu, he's an artist and an author. And I met Paul in 2007. We were forming um, the Iraqi Artists Association at that time. And I had the pleasure of meeting him and he introduced me to his book at the time, it's called My Last Thoughts About Iraq. Um, it's a wonderful book that includes images and poetry. Um, and over the years, we stayed in touch. I ended up writing a book called um, Iraqi Americans. It's a series and it was about, one of the series was about um, Iraqi artists. Um, and he's included in that book, of course. Then years down the line, <laughs> that's how intrigued I was with his artwork. I ended up asking him permission to use one of his art, beautiful, gorgeous art pieces for my book cover that I wrote. It's called Mesopotamian Goddesses. Um, so, I want to bring that up. Hi, Paul. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Caldean Cultural Center. And thanks everybody who's watching us. And hope you and your families are well and healthy. Now, we would have loved one day you'll, you'll be able to um, join us in person. And we'll be very happy to have a, another discussion where, we, where people can um, meet you live. <laughs> uh, but for now, um, you know, the, the amazing thing that I have found when I wrote the book about uh, Iraqi American artists, really aside from their artwork, is the stories behind their artwork. Um, I would, if you could share with us a little bit um, how, what you, you know, you were born in Iraq. If you can share a little bit your background and how uh, that has influenced your art today. Yeah, I was born in Iraq, 1959 in a tiny village, northern Iraq, at the border of Turkey called Tin. 1959, 60 or 61, the courts start like invading us. They end up burning our village. Then our refugee status like began. Like we moved to Sarsing, then to different cities, the Hawk, then we end up in Ninwet, then eventually we end up in, in Baghdad. That was the last station. And uh, were you able, you had mentioned, were you able to study in Baghdad? Uh, I remember there were some, due to some political tensions that, that interfered with your education as well during that time? Yeah, Baghdad, I wasn't accepted in, in elementary school because we didn't have ID or our ID was burned. Like we, we didn't have any paper, we are refugee. But I could join like a Catholic school and uh, at that time and my aunt was, was able to pay for that tuition until junior high I got an ID and joined the government schools. And, uh, and then what did you do as you got older and what led you um, to leave Iraq? I tried to join art school after high school but they told me it's close only to Baptist uh, party members. I studied the case in my mind to join the, the government party and go to art school, but I decided not. My degree was able me to join the pharmacy school. So I joined the pharmacy school. At that time, I found we have an art studio and a music studio. So I joined the art studio and trained with uh, a famous Iraqi artist for four years. Of course, after graduation, we have to join the army. It was 1982-83, where the war with Iran was intense. So I joined the army and served for five years. After five years, when I was dismissed from the army, I found no future like it. It's nothing for me here. So I decided to leave 88 to Greece, then end up in USA. Um, you know, so going back to um, this 
where you couldn't go into art school because you're not a Ba'athist. I, when I interviewed, this, is, well, this was something new to me that when I was interviewing the various artists, I realized that you know, some of, they couldn't get educated in their field because of that. Was that the situation for most of the education or is that just for certain types of uh, schools? You see, and I write the says, but you couldn't go into the other de department. No, no, it wasn't like prohibited from you to go to another department. Well, in pharmacy school, they they bother me every year, like maybe every month, sometimes every week to join the party. But I managed to escape that. How but I escape that pressure, despite that pressure. The service. In, in, in my childhood, when we were kids, like age of eight, nine, and back then, I was playing with so many like Arab kids in the neighborhoods. And one of them, I saw him in a pharmacy school. So he remembered me. Do you remember we were kids playing? That created a gr great connection. That guy, he became very powerful in Ba'ath Party. And I told him like, this is my desire. I'd like to to stay independent. He told me, don't worry, I will protect you. So I got that protection for four years, five years from him. Interesting. But um, so you were able to practice at least your artwork, even though given the situation, you, you were studying to be a pharmacist and you, you still practiced your artwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's fine, like you can't express your freedom. That's why. In pharmacy school, I, I try to learn uh, music, I play guitar, I write a poem, I paint, all these to escape the, the pressure of, the, of not having freedom. Like These provide me with, with freedom with, within myself to, to write what I, I like to do, to paint and to, to play a music I like. It no. wasn't easy. Like, it wasn't easy though, it was, it was a fine, I had to paint or something for the government, but all my painting at that time was human-like, uh, about the war, about the government, about, it's always related to human beings, so they, they it's, it was okay, like they asked me to paint something about war, to praise the government. I did an old painting of al qadisiyah battle. It was between Arab and Persian. And they hang it in the university and was good painting for them. Like that kept them away from me a little bit. Yeah, the, see the, the stories are so similar in nature in that um, other artists I had interviewed said some of them did get a little bit political and they actually, uh, experienced worse situations, the ones that didn't want to get involved, or they kind of went against the government, they experienced the worst situation. And there was a particular woman that I interviewed one time. She told me how she had to uh, paint in secret just because she didn't want to get involved. And so every time they wanted her to do something for the parade or something like that, um, she found ways to avoid it by saying she doesn't paint anymore. It was actually Emily Porter. I don't know if you've heard of her. Uh, she worked at the museum before, and she said she always found a way to, you know, to get out of it. But it's, it's interesting that, but she, but she continued to paint. And that's your story, too, is that despite the whole situation, you guys were cons consistently working. Um, now, what happened to this artwork that you did in Iraq? Were you ever able to bring it with you, or is it something that's still there? No, no, only, I think there was two was hanged in Iraqi museum, was loaded the art museum, and one of them still a big one in Northern Iraq. It's with my mom collection in the village. But I couldn't bring anything, only paper, poets, and some notes. Fascinating. And then what happened after that? Um, at some point you left Iraq. What was that like? 89. In 89? Yeah. And you came, did you, come directly to the United States, or what was your journey? No, I was lucky, like, nine months in Greece. I was lucky, like, to stay that short period. In Greece, I did some painting also to a Greek family, uh, write some poems there. It lasted, our, our short period in Greece, eight months, nine months, then we came to Los Angeles. 
Oh, that's a short time, yeah. And then, um, and that's where you've been living since then, since you came to the United yeah. States at your home, Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah. So um, I want to show some of your artwork um, that you have sent me. Obviously, you have, I mean, anybody can just Google your name and the amount of artwork that you've produced, it's just enormous and it's really beautiful. Um, one of which, like I mentioned, is the one where um, I picked this one for my book cover because, yeah, this one right there. <laughs> now, my niece, my niece and I were making these decisions together, and she's an artist as well. Um, and we had a hard time picking from your beautiful paintings because they're so happy. And the painting, the colors, you pick such you know, no matter what the situation, like looking at your artwork, you just feel like you enter a different world because of the colors. Um, and then there's a lot of emphasis on women and unity, uh, whether it's the women in, amongst themselves or as a community, there's emphasis on music. Um, there's just a lot of romance in your artwork. Um, and so, it's very rare that I have seen something dark. Even the dark ones have something so beautiful, like there's still some mystery and romanticism in it. Um, so I really love your artwork. And uh, I, this attracted us because of the colors, the women being able to be so expressive. And I assume these are um, the lettering. Is, is that Aramaic or what, what lettering? I never yeah. asked about that. Yeah, yeah they are <laughs> They're Aramaic. Is there a particular word that's behind there or just what what are the words that you chose? Mostly sometimes not. Like I'm a full time pharmacist though. Like I have a few hours to paint. So. You have a life. <laughs> was, well, that was, actually that's what's more even even amazing that you continue to produce despite the fact that you know you have all these responsibilities. No, sometimes so the work is so stressful, like uh, it's, it's stressful it's nowadays it's more like it's becoming it's different than 90s now it's becoming more stressful uh, when i finish work i come to home i try to close my eye for 15 20 minutes and then come to my studio either playing guitar or just paint that's why you like you see the beautiful colors the happiness the just an opposite the stressful time I spend in the pharmacy. Mm. So this is, yeah. Yeah, and you know, that's exactly what the feeling that it gives, that looking at it, it takes away all your problems and you enter into a different world and you think like, yeah, this is really, there is such beauty that exists in life. Um, and then um, my last thoughts about Iraq. I have, a, I have a copy here. I don't know if you have one at hand. Is there a, a poem that maybe you can read for us or... Um, I mean, you can read it a little bit later by, if you want to think of it, but I don't know if, do you have you, your book? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. If you can, you know, I have all these, if you can see, I have all these yellow um, stickers here with poems that I like, and they're quite a bit of them. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to let you pick the poem that you like to read. We would love to listen to it. This book, it's, it's unique to me. Like, uh, I collect so many phrases and sentences from Iraqis in the streets or during living there in the army while I'm sitting, chatting with them. I collect them in small pieces and still I have small pieces and I built a poem on that, that phrase or that sentence I heard. In 2005, I did an art show in LA called My Last Thought About Iraq. Of all these poems in my book, and I painted 28 pieces, introduced them to Alay. They liked them because mostly they were in Arabic calligraphy. And the art show was sold. And the gallery owner told me, I will print these poems in a book. So he helped me to do that. And that was my first book. If somebody collect this book, my last thought about Iraq, this is a story of every single Christian in Iraq, whether he's a Syrian, Chaldean, Syriac, whatever he want to call himself. This is his story, the story of refugee life. We lived as a gypsy in, in our country. We moving from one place to one place, finding peace or, or shelter. 
and it's memorized in this very, very tiny book. Great. Yeah, so please um, read us a few poems, if you could. You want me to read one poem? Yes, please. Yep. I will. I, I chose identity. This is like when when United Nations launch an an airstrike to to all to kill all Iraqis and destroy the the country. So here I am saying, I am not a Syrian or Chaldean or Akkadian. I am not a Christian or Muslim or Buddhist. I am a human. I was born in Mesopotamia. Ork, Nipar, Shurupak, and Sipar. I was born in Babylon, home of Anu and Ishtar. I am a son of Enlil, Shemesh, and Gilgamesh. I am a son of Ishtar, Aya, and Nensu. I was killed once by a flood, and a million times by a creature called the human, called country. I was killed by a nation or United Nation. Thank you. Um, you know what, that's another aspect of you that I always remember is when I was interviewing you and when we talked about your writing and when we talked about your art, you, it comes from the heart and from beauty and from love and there isn't so much emphasis on the titles that sometimes get in the way of us appreciating the beauty that's out there and the feelings that anybody can relate to who was a refugee or anything like that. Um, and then, and I remember I was really touched by your, dis your description of that, but you know, it's not just what you say. It really is true. I've watched how you live um, since I met you in 2007. That's over 10 years of us, uh, you know, being friends, I would say just watching each other's works and things like that, being supportive. And you've stayed true to that, that first and foremost, you're a human being and you're an artist who expresses something that anybody can just be in touch with. There's no restrictions on, um, there's no restrictions that are caused by all these labels. Yeah, I like simplicity, really just direct simplicity. I'd like to, Human need now colors and love and peace. Last November, for example, last November, I was called by art gallery in here in Claremont's uh, Square One Gallery. He told me like, why we don't do an art show about uh, Akito, the festival of spring in Mesopotamia. Last November, I told him, okay, I will do one. How many pieces? He told me 35 pieces because we will put mostly in the gallery and there's a restaurant, the Italian restaurant next door also, he liked to have some of these paintings. So I told him, okay, I will do it. Let's, let's plan for it. I wrote a poem, short poem, to memorize or to summarize all these 35 paintings. And the poem will read, this is in November last year. It's a very short poem. Peace upon you this spring, Ishtar, the queen of beauty and love. Peace to all plants and flowers. Peace to all birds and trees. Peace and love to all creatures on earth. Peace to you, bright sun, Shemesh. I created 35 painting on this one. It's all about love, bird singing, music, and, and colors. And people can Google Akito or in Akito and Claremont art by Paul, but they will see all the painting uh, to describe these poems. This is last year. And then in January, February, we have COVID-19 and the whole planet is in crisis. Yeah, but um, artwork like yours, poetry, really, I think it's medicine for the soul. Because if we get too caught up in the negativities of what's happening, then 
is just uh, it just doesn't help our health. I think so. Artists, writers, uh, I think they can contribute to make we need to make room for beauty regardless of what is happening. Um, and I think that you help do that. Now uh, I will want to give the people that have joined us the opportunity to ask questions if they have any. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat room. And I can ask Paul. William. Yes. I'm still waiting for my copy. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you made it until today to ask me, so now you have proof. <laughs> if I, I don't find I, it. I, I will send you copies. <laughs> And today immediately, so I can make sure I can have you back to. Um... Well, I, I need I need your I need your address too, so I will send you a copy of of the, my second book. It's it's all art pieces. All my collection is in that book. You know what? Your second art book. I ended up having to Google it and found that I didn't even know that you had um a, a second book. I, I don't have it, but we, we can bring it up. Um, Crystal, see if you can bring up his second one. It's called My People. I'm sorry, what was my art? My art, my, art, my people. My art. That one, yeah. And that one, because like I said, I don't have a copy of that. I just realized that you even have a second book. Um, is that mostly artwork or does it also include poetry and text and things like that? No, I, I put a short story, my short story. This is, this story was, it's, it's my, my life story. It's two pages only. This was published in uh, Iraqi Brains Between Exile and Assassination by David Yusuf. And I have also two pages of essay, My Art, My People, and the rest are all art pieces. It's okay. section like uh, about the, our culture. This is a colored book. I mean, like I didn't... Um, you know. Yeah, 300 pages of, of colored art pieces. Amazing, wow. See, I mean, honestly, um, how do you do that? So like, I have a question for you. Let me see if anybody has asked. How hard was it to start? Okay, that, there's a question for me. And you know what? I will use that question to also maybe hand it to you. So um, Gail has a question. She has, has Paul spoken to people of other faiths about his background and his art? Yes, yes. I did so many lectures here with different people, different colors, different identity in LA and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, the, um, again, and this is how I feel, what I've enjoyed about you is that you do make yourself available. There's no limitations on who you sp speak to. Um, and you just because your art speaks to everybody and we can see that um and also just even from the from the conversations that you've had um and you've i've seen you give one presentation as well um just very nice stories that you've shared um another person here, also yeah we uh, also i was chosen in, in new york uh, allison gory fine art to to uh as the only american two american one was me and one was uh, an artist from New York to exhibit an art show called Art Peace. They chose each artist from one continent and to share their art through a struggle. And one piece is, was mine. It was a cover of my, my last thought about Iraq. I think there was artists from Japan, Japan. there was artists from Africa, one artists from Europe, and two artists from, from United States, me, and one artist from New York. Um, you know, that brings me to this question, I'm, I'm wondering, because based on her question too, have you had the chance to visit the Middle East since you left? Have you had the chance to visit Iraq? I went, share 2000, your story or your 2000, art? 2014, I went to Iraq. Before, before the ISIS storm, oh. the country. And how was that trip? Were you able to share anything about your your work, or was it just a family visit? Just family visit. Really, I visited some some only northern part of Iraq. They told me they advised me not to go to Baghdad because it was wasn't safe. So only trips to villages to northern part to see how our people live. 
Um, you know, you have in your story, the one that I wrote, um, something you said, I wonder if I would have been able to do what I've done if I was still in Iraq. What do you think about that now? That was, you told me this in 2000, I, I forgot, I think the, pub, the book was published in 2015. How do, you, how do you feel about that now? This is my story. Iraq was, was really, it's, we didn't see like, some people they say great Iraq. No, it wasn't great like. I never heard my, my parents, grandparents, they say we live in peace there. No, for, for the Christian community or or non-Arab community was very harsh and hard living. Like we live refugee, we we move from place to place, and I don't think in Iraq I could accomplish anything because there is basically there is no democracy or no freedom. These are basic elements for artists to to thrive and produce good work to humanity. But we love the country and we love to have peace, not only in Iraq, but across the world. Like. Right. It's, it's like our heritage is from there. So regardless, there's still going to be always a connection. That's why whether you're, you or myself, um, we're, whether we're writing or we're representing that region some, somehow or another. Um, and then someone asked here, um, how difficult was it to start a cultural center and museum? Well, that took a lot of years and thankfully that our pioneers did um, persevered because it was over 10 years. The Chaldean Cultural Center was formed in 2003 and the museum only opened three years ago. And the reason it's so important is because, um, you know, outside of Iraq currently, Michigan has the largest concentration of Chaldeans. And what I'm, when I find something like people even within in Michigan, not knowing that a lot of our community members still speak um, Surat, you know, a form of Aramaic, um, and they consider it a dying language. Well, it is somewhat still spoken. And so I'm very happy, whether it's the Chaldean Cultural Center, whether the Assyrian uh, Society, I think it's called in Chicago, whichever uh, community creates a place, a haven, or uh, history, heritage, arts, and culture, especially of indigenous people that are on the verge of, of extinction right now. So it did take a while, but thank God that you know we've we've gotten this far with it. Um, and now with the opportunity to do virtual um, contact, we can connect to many of these artists and our authors so that they can share their work. Uh, what inspires your color palette choices for your paintings? That's a question from Dina. Dina, that's from Babylon. I used to visit Babylon every year. That's what the colors of Babylon. The walls, the, the grounds, and second thought is my culture. The colors of our, our clothing, our custom. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a more modern version, this painting right now that this is more, you know, the Dupka. <laughs> yeah, I have three of this, the same thing. One in, in picnic uh, clothing, one in traditional clothing, and one in the parties, like how we dress in the parties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, again, like I really enjoy that you bring this, the unity, the music, all the beautiful aspects of you know, like most of my collector are Jewish and I have Korean by buying our uh, painting. I have a Korean collector by buying our uh, painting of traditional clothing. They like the colors they told me. Yeah, it's interesting you said that about the Jewish. Uh, so I found that the Jewish community in some cases, I don't know, because they've been involved in rejuvenating their own history and culture and preserving um, their language and everything, but they're more aware of some of the history of the Chaldeans than the Chaldeans are, because given where we came from, the yeah, yeah, they they have interest in oppression. our history. yeah, because because we went through so much oppression. I used to wonder why is that? You know, why do we not know so much about our own heritage? Well, for one, you know, we could not. Um, we, 
They didn't teach us anything past 1400 years ago in, in Iraq. And then there was all the oppression and the struggle and the wars that we went through. There was no space for art and culture and reading and getting to even know who we are. It took for me to come here and as an adult to start discovering my own heritage. I didn't even know what the word Chaldean is. I didn't know what the word Assyrian. These are things that were introduced to me here. Um, so, but the Jewish community, the ones that come to our museum, I have found or have discussions, are aware of a lot of the things that we were yep. just discovering. Mm -hmm. So they have a, a greater appreciation for that. But that's what we're trying to teach our own people about these things. So um, let me see, I think if there's a last question here. Uh, so this is the last question I'll take because it's our time is almost up here. Um, do you see your art as political? How do you see it being used by people outside of you, like other members of the diaspora? One of the first pieces of your of your art that I saw was the depiction of the many massacres that gets shared on the anniversary of Seifo. Yeah, they can use it like this is massacre happens in 1915 where they slaughtered a lot of, of Assyrian from Turkey, from, from uh, Iran, and from Northern Iraq. And they massacred them not because of their identity, they massacred them because they are, first place, they were Christian. And they used my art, yeah, I did a hundred years of genocide. I did mention all the places where Christian are massacred, including like in, in Iraq, Semel, uh, uh, some villages in northern Iraq and Nineveh. They can use that. Yeah, uh, a hundred years of, since of genocide. Yeah, uh -huh. that's well, oh, when did you do that? When was what year? 1915. So did you include the more the recent one with the 19 uh, the 2014? No, yeah, that, that's yeah. All the massacre happened to our people in, in every region whether they were Assyrian, Chaldean, Syriac, uh, Armenian, or Yazidis. Well, these, are, these are facts. I have to, to, to do that. Like, I have to mention that. Like, as, as my family was victim, my, my grandma, she escaped Turkey to Lebanon, and where my mom, she born, and then moved to Iraq. Like, we live in circle like gypsy you're traveling from places to places and these affect our views and and our inputs i have to do every year something about the genocide well we thank you so much for bringing so much attention to our heritage to our history to our culture um, and doing it in a beautiful and informative way and doing it with multiple ways, including through paintings, through poetry, um, through books. So I really appreciate all your artistic work. In my talk, introduction to hate others and to hate other religion or to hate other people. No, these are facts. We will tell them as a history. We can't change that. But only love and music and art can change a human to, to, be, to be better and stronger. Yeah, you are bringing awareness to something that happened. And we do that here in the United States as well. It's not, it's not about looking away from what's happening. But again, and from what I've seen, your focus is always um, the love and the unity and um, you know, without shying away from the other truths that have happened. So again, Paul, thank you so much. And um, you know, one of these days, like I said, I hope that when you come to Michigan, we can do something, you know, a, a live setting, a live, live lecture with you. Uh, but please keep me posted that when your next book or something else comes out, we would love to have you again. Yes, thank you so much. I think I'm, you're, I'm, you're I'm, an inspiration I'm, to a lot of our, uh, a lot of members of our community and outside of our community as well. Yeah. Thank you. I thank you so much, like what you are doing in Michigan. Really, the opening of museum and Chaldean Cultural Center is is very great step. Like people would know our culture, our heritage, our language, our thinking, our colors, our political view. This is yeah. very important. And it's it's also a way to bring to unify. There's people yeah. 
because of, of everything that has happened to the people, they're all in different parts of the region, and we're hoping to kind of unify them somehow by by showcasing them in, in through you know um, certain areas, like cultural centers or educational centers, or however we do it. But we have the technology now, thank God, and so we can do that kind of stuff. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for joining us and uh, there will be a recording of this that we'll share on social media and we um, hope that you can join us next time again. Thank you. Stay well, everybody.